Welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Uh, my name is Chris Voss, and I will be your host for this virtual event. And today we are going to be talking with Master Carpenter, Norm Abram, and host of This Old House and Ask This Old House, Kevin O'Connor. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and in particular, our Beacon Circle members, we really appreciate your continued support of GBH. Before we get started, I just want to make a couple of friendly reminders, or if this is your first time joining us for one of these events, how they work. Unlike us, Norm, me, and uh, Kevin, you will not be on video, and we will not be able to uh, hear you or see you. That said, we do want to be able to know all your questions. So if you have a question you want to ask Norm or Kevin, uh, you have to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type that question in. We'd also love to know where you are tuning in from. So when you submit your question, just be sure to let us know where you're watching the event from. And also, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, be sure to give it a thumbs up and it will go to the top of the Q&A. To turn on closed captioning, this is what you do. You go and click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, and there will be two transcript display options that pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle option to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen, uh, but you can also select the full transcript option, and that means a sidebar will open up, and uh, then you can uh, see what each speaker is saying. Also bear in mind that because it is closed captioning, uh, things might be just slightly delayed. All right, so with that out of the way, it's time to welcome our two guests today. Two gentlemen, I'm sure, who need no introduction to all you watching today, but we'll get one anyway. Uh, Norm Abram and uh, Kevin O'Connor. Master Carpenter Norm Abram, he's been on This Old House since the series premiered in 1979, also was the host of the New Yankee Workshop uh, for many years and has been on today and The Late Show with David Letterman and Oprah and Entertainment Tonight and on and on and on. Although I think to me, most impressively, has hosted This Old House and uh, the New Yankee Workshop. And Kevin O'Connor has been the host of This Old House and Ask This Old House since 2003. He also hosts a podcast called Clear Story, uh, published a book called The Best Homes of This Old House. And perhaps one of the coolest things is that he was also on Ask This Old House uh, in its first season, which I think is pretty cool. And uh, so welcome both of you, Norm and Kevin. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Chris, and then to have everyone else from uh, the PBS world here as well. Yeah. Um, Norm, uh, first, congratulations on your retirement uh, and, and an, an incredible career. Um, I've been thinking about what to ask you first, and to me, it seems sort of like many people's retirement dream might be what you have done for your entire career <laughs> in, you know, going to a shop and working on some things. And so I'm, I'm sort of wondering what is your plan plan next after now that this old house mm. is, for you anyways, is coming to a close. Well, you know, I, you know, I've been in building for a long period of time. It's the thing I love to do. Um, actually, what I'm thinking about doing in the future is not so much working on a house or um, on something or building furniture because I've done so much of that. I don't have enough. I need I have too much furniture. <laughs> but um, so I started thinking about that before I decided to opt out of the show and move forward with that. So the one thing I want to do that I've always wanted to do is build a boat. I did build one for New Yankee, a very small one that was more for kids. And um, I've visited the Hairshop Museum in Bristol, Rhode Island several times. And I've been on there on a mooring with my boat. And I watched these kids go out in these 12 and a halfs and go sailing, which I said, ah, that's what I wanna build. <laughs> because <clears throat> it'll be a challenge. It'll be something I've never done at that, that level. I may even have to go to, to uh, boat school in Newport, <laughs> but um, that's what I really want to do. I'm, I'm going to have, have a shop. We have a, a shop of my own is in development right now uh, at a house that we have, not where I am right today, but um, that's what I want to do. That's awesome. I love that answer. That's really cool. Uh, looking back at your career, 
can you, especially if people aren't aware of how this old house came about mm -hmm. can you talk just a little bit about how this this revolutionary television series came together back in 1979 well you know it was really the the work of russell morash who created the show from the beginning i mean he had done victory garden and other shows but really a child he, um, well he did some uh he did a political show i don't remember the name of it but it was mostly when he started doing victory garden that was the first big one that came up then it was julia child and then <clears throat> somehow I ended up like it's too hard too too much time to get how I actually met him. Mm. But um, when he was going to go to the idea of doing a house, he contacted me um, because someone told him that I had the smallest scrap pile in the world. <laughs> so and that's very that's very rush. Russ likes things like that. So he brought me to the house in Dorchester not really knowing how he was gonna put this thing together and uh, asked my, you know, what I thought. And it had some work that had already be do been done and I didn't feel it was up to, up to what it should be. And uh, he said, okay, well, let's, let's figure out what we should do with this. And unlike shows he made after, the, after that, after we started building that project where you had people you knew what they were gonna do, it was like we were, uh, a bunch of gypsies <laughs> and I didn't even know any of these people but he put these people together even the person who was going to write the book was on the roof you know stripping off shingles and so it worked though we, we worked on it uh, we had different people come in and I think you know he felt after working with me for a little while that I was sort of going to sort of lead the carpentry elements of it and then of course Richard Tuthui came in and he became the plumber expert so once he started to build that group, um, it came together pretty quickly. And uh, when he finished the show, it actually got an Emmy that first year, a New England yeah. Emmy. Yeah. And um, when, when he finished that show, he said, I have no idea what we're gonna do. And, and in the video that he had this week, I said the same thing. I said, I have no idea where we're going. And then he goes and does the, the uh, Bigelow House <clears throat> in Newton, which is a gigantic, you know, and it needed a lot of work and because we then it got a little better because we got started bringing in other contractors um there was a lot of things that you could put on the show to help people understand how a house is renovated and so forth and so on and from there on we had a we had a model of how we should move forward with it uh, it's uh, it's it's indicative, I think, of those early days of public media, too. We're going to just sort of figure out where we're going to go and make it work. And, you know, if the guy with the smallest pile can save us some money, so we're not wasting materials, then that, that's not so bad either. Uh, Kevin, you have um, you have the enviable position of having both been part of the show as, a, a, I don't know, a guest, I suppose, and then actually getting to work with the, with with these folks and, and running. Can you talk just a little bit about how, how you came to be part of this, this enterprise? Sure, although I, I do have to say that there's nothing more norm to my ears than his retirement plan, which is of course to build the boat rather than just sail the boat, but right. uh, it's not a surprise at all, Norm. When you're done building it, I'll sail it for you, Paolo. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have different ideas about retirement. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a story I've told a million times, but I love telling it because it's such a good one. I grew up watching the show, as I think a lot of people did. You know, Chris, you mentioned you did. Yeah. My brother's my dad, you know, watching it. Um, so when I got married, my wife and I, Kathleen, you know, we knew we wanted to buy a fixer upper uh, because I enjoyed doing it. And we did buy a fixer upper and we started working on it like a lot of young people do. They don't have enough money to buy a completed house. So they uh, buy one that's incomplete, needs a lot of work. And very quickly into the project, we were over our heads. Um, tearing down walls is easy. Putting them back up is a little harder. And we also were trying to replicate some historical details. And I don't know why. I honestly, to this day, I don't know why. But we were trying to replicate a, a one particular historical detail. Came to the end of our rope and decided to write the magazine, this old house, which we were subscribers to, for advice, which to me sounds sort of inconceivable that anyone would write a magazine looking for advice. But anyway, we did. Unbeknownst to us, they were starting the sister show, Ask This Old House, that year. 
And as everyone knows, the concept of ask, which is different than house, is instead of a, a year-long renovation where Norm and the boys are renovating the entire house, ask is the same group of guys going out, ringing doorbells, answering questions, and showing homeowners how to do smaller projects. Because it was the first season and wasn't on the air yet, there was no mailbag for them to kind of dip into of uh, viewers questions. So they turned to the magazine and they said, hey, you guys got any letters? Out came Kathleen's and my letter. They read it, we were local and they sent the television crew, Tommy and Jim Clark, our painting expert up to the house. And they came out and we filmed two segments that day um, for a show that I didn't even know existed, but who cared? Because when they called up and said, do you mind if this old house comes to see you and brings Tommy Silva along? I was like, uh, for whatever you want to do. <laughs> um, we filmed, and as you can imagine, I did all the goofy things that any sort of starstruck fan would do. I asked to have a picture on the front porch with them, and, you know, we took the picture, sent them on their way, and thought we'd never see them again, and completely out of the blue, a few weeks later, we had a phone call, which very quickly turned into, a, would you like to host both of these shows, which was inconceivable to my wife and I. I tried to tell my boss at the bank where I was working that I was leaving. And he's like, you're going to do what? No matter how many times I said, he's like, I still don't understand. What are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to host the show. <laughs> so it was right place, right time. Uh, it was a dream job for me. I still pinch myself that it actually happened that way. But it's been a, it's been one of my greatest privileges to be work, you know, next to these guys who are my icons growing up. Um, to have that opportunity and then to find out that they're as real and as genuine and as smart and as kind as you would think that they are on TV when you meet them in person to find out that that's that's really who they are it's been a joy I mean I know what you're talking about with that starstruck thing I'm having that moment right now <laughs> and, uh, it, it's pretty awesome and especially as as a host I have to say that you know your connection with the audience and being being almost a foil for the audience and asking the questions we would ask is is incredible and I admire your work a, a ton um, I, I've got the easy part. I get to ask the experts why and what and how and all that kind of stuff. They're the ones who've got to deliver all the quality information. So and yeah. there's no finer crew of people to do it. Um, yeah. I, I know that this audience who's joining us today knows this, but I'm not sure the broader audience really appreciates that these, these gentlemen and these women are professional tradespeople first and foremost. They all kept their day jobs. You know, they all continued to build houses or be plumbers or electricians. Um, when they weren't filming this old house and asked this old house and none of them gave that up. So you were, it is, I think, part of the secret sauce of the show, you know, real craftspeople working on real projects for real homeowners, um, sharing with the audience the right way to do things. It works. It definitely yeah. works. Well, and it feels like there's kind of a, a shift to these. We're going to get to some audience questions here in a second, but I want to talk about the craftsperson thing and, and go back to, to you, Norm, in how you got into carpentry in the first place. And if you're seeing perhaps a shift going back to the trades uh, here in the, in, the, in the 2020s, perhaps your history, and then how you've seen that change over the years. Right. <clears throat> well, actually, you know, my father was a carpenter. Um, he built the house I grew up in. And there was a great picture in the video of, I don't know if, well, maybe they didn't put that one in, but my father was on a, on a ladder near the side of the house and my sister and I were at his, at his feet, <laughs> little, little kids. And, you know, when I was around, he worked for a company, he didn't have a company of his own. He was an unbelievable uh, craftsman as well. And he would bring home materials and in our basement, he had a, little setup with a table saw and a joiner and so forth. And I was allowed to be down there with him. Um, and the first job I was allowed to do was sweep up the sawdust. No touching tools, <laughs> not until I was ready. And he never really pushed it on me. He just had me by his side. And I was, I just, I guess I was just love to be there and see these things come to be. And then eventually let me start using the table saw. And then he started doing other things. And then he actually, uh, when I went to school, high school, well, hopefully legally before I was on a job site <laughs> um, that he was working on for a different company, I worked on those sites every summer and even winter um, breaks. I would work with the company he was working for and that's how I got money together to go to college. He wanted me to go to college. I did go to college. I went to the University of Massachusetts, started out in engineering 
for two years. And eh, it was okay. But um, when I was in a class with, you know, a hundred people, it wasn't for me. But when I made a little clamp um, with metal on a shop, I said, that's what I want. I was in a fraternity. I was going to leave school. They said, no, 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 why don't you do something else? And so I said, all right, I want to have a construction company. So I'm going to go to the other side of the campus and get to learn how to build a company. So I did that for three years. And in the third year, I said, I've had enough. <laughs> and I found a little note um, on, a on, a, on a board saying uh, these three guys who were had just come out of Harvard, I think, and they were going to be the businessman. And then they had one guy who was going to be kind of the builder guy. And um, they were looking for people to work for them. So I went for an interview. Um, I liked them. They were going to be building condos up in Vermont. Um, one, and so I decided I was going to be paid less than where I was working with my father, but I want to go someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to Vermont, and long story short, I went from project to project. I became running, I was running the job um, after the first manager had to go back to school. And from there, that's the way it went until I finally got tired with them and decided it's time for me to build my own company and yeah. um, go from there. And, you know, I just got into that and I love, love to build and did a lot of different kinds of projects, renovations, um, and a lot of new construction as well. Yeah. But, the, but the real piece that put me there was my father. I mean, yeah. he got me into something that I really love to do. And um, there's some, there was some pretty funny um, videos in the picture. There's one of me on a trailer as a little kid with my grandfather there, and I'm screwing down a boards on a trailer my father was making. It, it, was, it was just, you know, I just lived in this environment that was really amazing. And, yeah. you know, always you always have... You know, can, you want to say, well, am I doing the right thing? But I find that, and me and somebody asked this word, word, word um, not this thing, this thing um, a couple of days ago, said, what made you go in the pace, places you went? I said, I did run into forks in the road where I had to say, do I want to go here or do I want to go there? And I guess I'm lucky in the way that I guess I chose the uh, right path for what I wanted to do. I have no... Um, feelings of that I went in the wrong direction. Um, I love what I do. I love working with the people that I do. And in terms of the trades moving forward, it's starting to move very slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some schools that are putting um, those things back into in positions in schools for kids to do very simple projects. That's all I'm asking them to do. You know, just get them let, where my father started me that's where we should let young people have exposure to carpentry and anything like that. And they may, if they like it, great. And if they don't and they want to go to college, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so it, Mike Rowe, you know, he's the, he's the guy. Um, yeah. He, uh, I went and spent some time with him and, and we've had him on the show a couple of times and he, um, He's a good leader for this as well. And he has, he has people in Washington he can talk to and try to push it a little bit harder. Well, it's, it's a great thing. I've seen those episodes. It's a great thing that you guys are, and, and, and Kevin as well, that you're pushing people to say, it's okay. You know, if you like doing this, then go do this thing, you know, with your life. Um, we've got a, a bunch, so many uh, questions from the audience. And uh, I'm going to, uh, well, start in, in there, uh, I, I particularly like this question here from uh, from I hope I pronounce this right, Dallin. Uh, it says, "What is the biggest revolutions in tools over the course of your career that have made the biggest impact for you?" I think ev evolutions, perhaps, also uh, of of tools over the course of your career that have perhaps made things easier for you. Yeah, I, I remember the early days, you know, that you'd come with a toolbox filled with hand tools and be working with those more than you were working with power tools. Um, and the, the power tool um, industry is really ramping it up. I mean, they've come together with tools you would have never imagined 
um, back in the time when I started. I mean, I have old you know, saws down in my basement that I don't use anymore because there's other things that are, that are better. The, the only thing that I find in, interesting with it, it's a little bit of a, you know, people say, well, you're using tools to do all of this stuff. Well, you know, it was done with hand tools and there's nothing wrong with doing it with power tools and you can do both if you want to. And now they're developing tools that can cut lumber and make it easier to um, disassemble a building a house even. Um, and that's, that's good because uh, to a certain extent, because if um, it's really getting the people to become uh, carpenters is not quite where I would like to see it right now yet. I think it's got to grow some more. The tools will never take over that all of that work. So you still need the hands to do it. Um, you know, I mean, it, the tools, I think you shouldn't make the tools be, the tools are a helper, basically. That's what I would say. And uh, the development comes by just comes by from carpenters who think and say, okay, how do I do this job? Like, it's like making a jig. Instead of making a jig for something, you make a tool for something. Right. And that's, that's gonna go on forever. And uh, the materials we use now in building requires different tools that we didn't have in the past. So it's an, it evolves as it goes. I think it's gonna continuously be evolving to do the best work. I was uh, think that there's a romance to hand hewing your own yeah. board, but I bet the guys hand hewing those boards wish they had a, a saw to do that to do yeah. that work for them. Um, a question for both of you. I start with Kevin and, and then go back to Norm. Um, that that a, a few folks have asked about, uh, which is what are your favorite houses? I guess Kevin, you started I think in season twenty five. So uh, 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 favorite houses that you've worked on on over or favorite house, perhaps if you can pick one over the years that you've been with the show? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard because there's a lot of really good ones. Um, for me though, it was one of the first, it was our 25th anniversary and it was the Carlisle project. Um, and there were a couple of things about it that were unique. Um, it, the, as you guys know, we work with homeowners uh, who ask us to renovate their primary house and very rarely do we ever not work with a homeowner. But for the 25th anniversary, we decided to purchase this uh, farmstead, the Carlisle house, renovate it, uh, and then allow a bunch of designers to come in and turn it into a show house so that the PBS audience could come and walk through the house. And a couple of things resulted because we chose to do it that way. First, it was a year long project as opposed to one or two a year. Um, second, uh, Tommy and the guys were completely unleashed. <laughs> they didn't have a homeowner um, whose whims and budget constrained what they could do. They could do anything they wanted basically to this house. So it was this big opus moment. Um, and there were three parts to it as well. There was the original Greek revival. There was a connecting L to a barn, which had been a working barn when we put our hands on it. Um, and what ended up happening as part of the plan was the barn was converted from uh, basically working barn livestock space to living space. The L was taken down and rebuilt using prefabricated construction with prefab um, foundation panels and wall panels and roof panels and such. And then the original Greek revival home was sort of lovingly restored. So for me, being new to the show, it was a grand project. Um, it was watching this troupe of craftspeople sort of do whatever they wanted at the highest level. And we touched on basically the, the restoration, the re-adaption of the space and the rebuilding of a space all in one. So it was a, if you wanna talk about diving into the deep end of the pool, I was pushed into the deep end of the ocean on that one. And it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. I was young, I was new, uh, my first kid was born during that project. So there's a lot of sort of stimulation in my head that keeps it kind of sticky there as my favorite project. Um, and, and, and letting, you know, Norm and Tom and, and Richard and Roger do whatever they want, that's a situation you want to kind of be around. How about you, Norm, favorite house? Well, the, the, 
uh, both house, um, house that I mentioned in uh, Newton was one of my first uh, favorite houses because it was it was about to go into the ground because there was it had been empty for years and it's this town really wanted to make sure that they could um, save it and it became you know there was like the house the main house the barn and all these the woodshed they became individual um, condos yet the the outside um, look of the house was purely like it was from the day one and uh, it was, a, it was a big challenge to do and a lot of people um, helped on that project. Um, the second project that was one of my favorites um, was Santa Fe. When we went to Santa Fe oh. and did a house there um, for an artist, they were, husband and wife were both artists. The building was, oh, it was in a, you know, it's different. It's not, there's no studs there. That's all, you know, it's all concrete or whatever. And um, it was in tough shape, and uh, but we we put it together, and it was, they were really good customers as part of the show. And being that we were out of New England, it was something that was so different from here. And to see the technology and how you built a house and how those uh, adobe houses really hold up in that part of the country if they're cared for very well. So um, that was good. But I remember one day, see, one of the things about doing the TV show with Russ was. There was never a list of things. There was a very minimal list. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. No details. <laughs> so we're working on the project one day. And somebody went into the side room and said, oh, you got to see these guys. They're cutting through the uh, wall, the outside wall to put in a window. We're going, what? So we go out there <laughs> and we go into this area and they got a piece of wire um, from uh, the fence, you know, this, that kind of wire. And they had put a hole through it and they were using that as the tool. We were talking about tools, taking that and running it up and down, up and down, up and down and cutting a big opening for a new window. And Russ immediately jumped on that and said, we got to shoot that. We got to see these guys doing that thing. So that was, uh, that was interesting. We went back to that house a couple of times um, to see it. And, uh, and there were a lot of the uh, houses outside of New England, but um, Santa Fe and, and Newton were my favorites. Kevin, how does the show work today? So not in that, well, I guess they're cutting through the wall today. We're going to look at that. But I mean, today the show feels very much like we are seeing exactly what you want us to see. Can you talk us a little bit about how, uh, how the a show comes together? Well, Russ's influence is still very uh, prominent in how we make the show today. Um, I was fortunate to work with him for years. Uh, obviously, you know, Norm, Tommy, Richard uh, all work with him. So there is sort of a, a DNA that's been imprinted on the show based on what he's done. Yeah. Uh, we do try to get to the job site with an outline. Uh, it's not heavily scripted even to this day. Um, and we do try to sort of let the job site dictate what we show. It's a complicated process to build a house and to make a television show. So I don't want to make it sound like we're just kind of showing up without a game plan. Uh, we're not. Um, but we are making changes and we're adapting as we go. Uh, I'll give you an example. I just came from the job site. We're filming today on one of our projects. It happens to be close. So I was able to run home for this. Um, to do this from my living room with my dog who's trying to get out here in the back. <laughs> um, and what we were talking about is how we've got this old timber frame building that's being saved, but they want to uh, expose the timbers on the inside of the house, which requires us to build sort of a roof on top of it on the outside of the house. We've got to get the insulation out there. So we know that that's sort of the situation that we've got to talk about. But once we get up onto the scaffolding and Tommy and Charlie Silva start building this thing out, you immediately bump into things that the producers haven't thought about or ways to tell the story. For example, the insulation that we're trying to put on the top of the house is about two and a half inches thick. We don't have to meet code, but if we did, you'd have to get about eight to 12 inches of thickness of this um, polyisocyanate insulation on the roof. Well, how do you tell that story? And you realize that you now are on the roof watching this whole thing go down and there's a dormer there that's going to be affected by it. So immediately 
a producer or Tommy or a director makes a decision, let's build a quick mock-up, let's show what the layers look like, let's put it up next to the dormer. Everything shuts down while we go and we build that so that we can show that in real time, demonstrate to the audience. The, the job site and the craft that the contractors are doing are primarily driving the content, uh, primarily driving the outline and what we end up shooting. It is produced. We do have an outline. There's a lot of work that goes into making sure that we cage that beast. But at the end of the day, a lot of what you know Russ instilled in everybody, which was, if there's a guy using barbed wire to cut a hole in an Adobe house, stop everything <laughs> and cover that. Yeah. Uh, so be nimble and adjust on the job as quickly and as efficiently as you can. We're still doing it today. Well, it's impressive because you're doing those 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 walking shots that are just they would seem to be really complicated to get each in order in such a way that it just flows. But it, it's seamless. It's 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 awesome. Well, I, I'll yeah. share with you, Chris, that I enjoy those the most. And that is definitely Russ's style. Norm, you know this as well as anybody, you know, the sort of kind of go with it, keep moving. And back when Norm and I were working together sort of every day. I, I have to say this, one of my favorite scene partners, because he had done it for so long when he and I were walking next to each other, we kind of knew what had to be covered. I say A, he says B, I say C, he says D. Well, if I dropped, you know, C, he knew it needed to be brought up. And so he'd pick it up and I would then adjust and I would pick up, you know, his D part and we could ping pong back and forth. And so it is a very fluid, it's a skill, but it's also very natural. Um, and it's just us walking through talking about what, we've done there there is norm i don't even know if you remember this but i think it's the bigelow project it's one of my all-time favorite examples of this bob vila approaches the house in a helicopter <laughs> <laughs> and they have one of these big long construction booms with a bucket and a cameraman up there this is the day when there are cords still attached to cameras mm. so there's this 50 foot cord coming out of the bucket Vila lands in the yard. The bucket comes down with the cameraman. He gets out of the helicopter and proceeds to walk around the house to give a tour. And this thing goes on continuously, nonstop, one take for like nine minutes. Yeah. And I'm just like, when do I get to do that? That's unbelievable. One take from a helicopter with a cameraman attached to a cord. It's insane. It was, I just, it's unbelievable. That they <laughs> that. Wow. I love it. Yeah. I think it's, like, I miss it, to be honest with you. The fact that we can, you know, we can cut and edit and splice all that is a, is a wonderful thing, but I would, I would much rather dismount from a helicopter and roll around the house. And stumble <laughs> up and you can climb up on some crappy scaffold and keep going. <laughs> Uh, your pledge dollars hard at work for the helicopter rental. <laughs> Never break a scene, Norm, right? Never yeah. break a scene. Right. We, we've been beat. It's been beaten into us. Do not oh. break a scene. Russ would come over and hit you with a two by four if you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That made me. That's funny. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk to Jamie here in just a second. But before we do, I've got Norm. I want to ask one more question. We've got, uh, well, we've got one more question but one more question here from david here in this first half uh, that i like he says uh if you were to build a brand new house today but in any style that you'd like what what perhaps is your favorite style to build in or that you admire the most of historical building stuff <clears throat> well it's it's a it's this is interesting because i just got done um building another house i didn't build all the work i had a really good contractor but and I did, but had an ec excellent um, architect uh, who has done much work for uh, uh, this old house, Sally DeGaran. She's uh, out of Lexington. Yeah. And um, it's kind of, it's kind of reminds me a little bit. It's like a small version of sort of a Bigelow house. It's more arts and crafts looking, but it's not heavy arts and crafts. So, and we built a house. <clears throat> that has first floor living because I'm getting a lot older. I don't want to climb the stairs anymore, but it does have uh, um, some, some uh, space upstairs with bedrooms that um, we can use. Um, we, we want, it's not a year round yet, but um, that's, that's what I wanted to build. It's exactly the house I wanted to build because it gave us everything that we were looking for 
as we get, I mean, we're getting older, so not everybody's gonna be looking at it in that way, but um, just very clean, um, designed, I mean, it's all with the architect a lot of times. I mean, you can see some terrible architecture, but you can see something you really love. And people that we know, when they first saw that house, they were just blown away. They thought they love it. So, um, you know, that's kind of where yeah. I would go next. I mean, we already built it. I don't think I'm gonna build another house. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I can go out and have some fun. But uh, is, does that answer the question? Does that answer? I, the question? So. I mean, personally, I think I'd skip brutalism and I'd, I'd do something like stick style. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that'd be my, but I don't know how to build a house. So that's okay. uh, maybe a little different. We use really good materials. And, you know, the, 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 when you look at it, you say, well, something's a little different here because over here we have shingles and over here we have shiplap. And over here we have a wood shingle roof and over here we have metal. But it all looks great the way it yeah. came in together. That's great. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to get to a lot more of your questions here in, in just a moment, but for uh, just a moment as well, I want to uh, welcome and introduce uh, my former colleague, the person who got me my, my job at GBH, Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, Chris. I'm so great to be with you today. Um, you know, audiences turn to GBH for many reasons whether it's to learn more about home renovation with this old house and ask this old house or to receive fact-based journalism. Whatever the show, whatever the topic, whatever you learned from it, your vital support helps create great programs for the public good for everyone to benefit from. That's what makes GBH so special. And we have a special offer for today's guests. If you donate $10 a month as a GBH sustainer, we will send you a This Old House 40th Anniversary Package, including the 40th Anniversary DVD, a collectible Norm mug, and a This Old House Insider Membership. Now, the This Old House Anniversary DVD includes interviews with hosts and cast members, vintage clips, and favorite moments from the series that inspired an entire genre of television programming. Now, you might be wondering what Insider Benefits include, so I'm going to tell you that too. This Old House Insider Membership Benefits include unlimited commercial free streaming um, to all of This Old House and Ask This Old House episodes. That's more than a thousand episodes at your fingertips so you can watch it on your schedule. You'll also have special access to live online Q and A's with the cast, live webcam footage, the ability to explore 26 years of This Old House magazine, via the digital archive and exclusive giveaways and discounts only for this old house insider members. Such a cool thing. And let's not forget the collectible Norm mug. So not only can you look at Norm every day, but <laughs> the mug is also dishwasher and microwave safe. That definitely checks off items on my list when it comes to using mugs and has that very comfortable C handle. So you can hold the mug very comfortably and uh, enjoy sipping your coffee and tea. So you get the insider membership, the mug, and that DVD. It is a great value. It's valued over $200. Um, but today you'll get it for only $10 a month. That's only $120 a year, and you'll be doing something great for GBH in the process. So giving to GBH is simple and secure, and there are three ways to give today. And we're going to also go over these options in the chat right now. You can visit gbh.org slash support events. You can send a text to 800-204-204. 3811 using the keyword GBH to donate. So leave out the W, just GBH to 800 204 3811. 
or you can skew, uh, excuse me, you can scan the QR code pictured behind me and a donation form will magically appear on your smartphone or device. There will never be a better time to give than right now, everyone. Don't put it off any longer. Donate to GBH today and you will receive, again, the This Old House 40th Anniversary Package. $200 value, yours today for only $120 a year, $10 a month. And if you are a big fan of the show like I am, you will not want to miss this chance um, to receive this special 40th anniversary package while supplies last and they won't last forever. So please take a few minutes today to make your donation to strengthen GBH and the news, information, and culture that enriches your thinking, decision making, conversations, and daily life so often in so many ways. Moments you spend with GBH are well spent, and your donation today would be money well spent too. So I hope uh, all of our friends at home will decide to support GBH today, get this fabulous package. And now I'm going to hand it back to my friend Chris, who used to be a volunteer, then he became a radio host. And uh, who knows what's in store for Chris in the future? I can see him hosting a, a television show maybe yeah, one right. day. Yeah, right. I can host a Zoom show for sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jamie. Um, You're welcome. So, Norm, I've been looking through some of these questions here, and some of them are getting on the uh, the technical side of things. If you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in that direction. Um, one of them, and now I can't find it, but it had to do with biscuit joinery and how, after a number of years and a number of usage. Um, oh, this is from Tom. He says, uh, how are your projects using biscuit joints like uh, the pie safe or the pantry table have held up over the years? Tom, coming in from Roanoke, Virginia. <clears throat> uh, they've held up fine. Um, they're not as strong as some of the ones we use now because we have the ones you can do. Well, you could always do dowels. Right. But there's um, now there's uh, you know composite materials that you can cut into it and then put it in and it will lock it together. Um, the only time you would have, ever have an issue would be if it's something that puts a lot of pressure on it sideways. But really, th those are really for aligning the two pieces together. And if the glue is put in correctly and is clamped, it's really not taking any stress. The glue will hold it in place. It just makes it a lot easier to um, put things together. And it's, uh, you know, you can get a, the tool for that is not very expensive. and you can go from that. Awesome. Thank you, Tom, for your question. Uh, I want to uh, jump over now to uh, Kevin, because we know you were mentioning that you, you've got a project that you're working on right now that you're going to jump off to in about a half hour. Uh, what is coming up next in in uh, the next uh, season of, of uh, This Old House and Ask This Old House? So we've got three projects coming up for the current season. Uh, we're going to premiere the first episode of the first project tonight, actually, uh, on PBS. Um, and I can walk you through them quickly. I've got a couple photos here. The first one we're working on is down in Atlanta. It's in the city proper on the south side. You can see the house behind us, and you can see the homeowners here in front of us. Um, this house was built in 1890s, um, and if you look at the second picture out front, you'll get a sense of sort of how far gone it has been. Uh, it was abandoned when the house was purchased by our homeowners, who you saw in the previous picture. Uh, it's got a little bit of a history to it. Uh, it was built by the first African-American postmaster general of Atlanta who lived here. It's a gorgeous house with the details of the tall ceilings and the ornamentation and such. Um, the neighborhood has seen better days. This house, as I mentioned, was empty, but these homeowners are now committed to um, restoring it and bringing it back. This is the front that you're seeing there with the robust front porch, the asymmetrical massing on it. And then the next picture sort of takes you around to the side and the back, and you can see that it extends out. Um, I think it also gives you sort of a sense of how far gone it is. This back little third of the house comes down and gets rebuilt and gets pushed over a little bit as we renovate it. Um, and we're going to turn it back into a single family house uh, for our homeowners. Um, and we'll spend a bunch of episodes working on that project. 
Uh, I believe there's one more photo of it as well. Th these are our homeowners. They live in Atlanta. Um, they were familiar with the house. Um, they had sort of had their eye on it for a while. They finally bought it and we were very pleased to make a connection with them and a local builder. So we're gonna tell their story about how they turn it back into their family's home and, and save this beautiful gem from the 1890s. Uh, after Atlanta, viewers are gonna see our second project, which is in Newburyport, Massachusetts, up on the coast out by um, you know, just north of where I am right now. Uh, this house is right downtown, walking distance to the waterfront, also built in the 1890s. Um, good location, typical for this neighborhood, uh, actually owned by a female Irish immigrant to the United States who rented it out for many years. Um, and it's had a lot of folks associated with the um, various industry that was uh, typical in Newburyport back in the day. So some shipwrights, some uh, coopers, some silversmiths, all living in this house. We've now got, again, another young family who lives here now. It hasn't really been updated for 50 or 70 years, so they're going to make some updates. They're not really changing the footprint. You can see a small screened in porch here to the front left. That's just going to become interior space. We're going to close that little bump out off of the back. But we'll tell the story of Newburyport and we'll show how you work within the existing footprint of this house to modernize it, update it with both the electric, the plumbing, the HVAC, all these types of things. And then from Newburyport, we jump to the third project, which is the one that I just came from. This is in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, I'm about 10, 15 minutes from where this home is. This is a what they call a first period house, uh, which means uh, this one was built in 1720. So those early years from 1650 or so to 1720, they call the first period. This is a Gambrel style home out front, which you're looking at. There's a timber frame underneath there. And then coming off of the back, as illustrated in the second picture, um, they put a connecting L that came off the back of the house, which is also a timber frame. Um, and this connecting L was built uh, either at the same time as the original house or very shortly thereafter. Um, and so the homeowners who have just bought this, they love the fact that it's an old house. Um, we're going to convert this L, which is now two stories, back to its original one story design, but save the timber frame underneath. And then they're going to push off the back of the house, a garage with living space up top. Um, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're working on this idea of exposing the timber frame bones of this building so that you can see them and enjoy them from the inside. So right now the roofs are off. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to apply exterior insulation. We're going to talk about this period um, style home, show you some fine examples of it let the, the these crafts people show their sort of trades to how you would update it modernize it but respect and preserve all of the sort of the structural integrity of this house as well as all the original details in the front house so three projects for our upcoming season to premiere um, literally tonight on, on pbs wgbh this one sits on the ipswich river um, that porch was not original to the house. <laughs> Neither was the lattice work. That's all gone. But if you were standing on that porch right there, looking out those windows, you would be looking at the Ipswich River, um, which is very typical that they built these houses because it's a little maritime community. Uh, and most of the folks made their made their livings by working off of that river, whether they were clamming or schooners, shipbuilding or bringing in materials and such. So I think it's going to be a pretty good season. Uh, the only the only downside about the upcoming season is that my buddy Norm and I are going to get to work together on it because he's decided to retire on me and go build a boat. Thanks for <laughs> that, Appreciate it. I don't see you drinking Kevin cup. I'm drinking out my Norm cup, but no, you're leaving me leaving me hanging, pal. I'll check up with you. <laughs> Thank well, you. if you're if you're doing that Newbury Port House with the shipbuilding right down the street, maybe Norm can just uh, just yep. swing Same. on by. Um, you you just mentioned timber framing, uh, and I was wondering if either of you could just talk a little bit about the difference between those old style uh, timber frame and and uh, what what is a, a new style of construction would be a stick style, I think something like that, right? What the difference is? Um, I'm not quite sure <clears throat> what you. What the difference between a, 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 a timber framed building is versus a, a more modern oh, building? Oh, more modern house? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of um, materials, particularly, you know, everything used to be spruce and it was two by fours and two by sixes. 
and all of that. And now there's engineered um, materials that are made. Uh, in fact, I would part of one of our one part of our house is very high wall. So you have these they're layers of material and they're super strong. Um, so there's a lot more of that. You know, regular lumber these days is there's still good lumber out there, I will say that, but the stuff that's put together and that's stronger and is, is more stable is being used a lot more than it was in the past. I mean, in this house we were in, I'm in today, I had eye joists and that was 30 years ago um, in the floors of that and um, did, did an interesting thing, which is do eye joists, plywood, and then lightweight concrete and put all the heating in the floor. And it still held up great. And wherever there was wood, you had to make sure you use the white wood finish floor. You had mm -hmm. to use um, species that would hold up with the heat and not buckle or anything like that. So vertical grain materials and stuff like that. But um, in structural beams now, you know, it used to be all steel. Now you can get it in wood. So there's a lot of um, things doing, being done. And there was one thing I found out recently that's being done is um, on the house we, we, we did, I mentioned earlier, when they had to do the rafters for the roof, they didn't do it any on any of that was on site. There's actually a factory that gets the plans. They come in when the walls are up, you know, the house always grows just a little bit. When the walls are up, they took all the measurements, um, put that all together, gave it to the, company that make cuts all the lumber up. So there's no no lumber sitting on the job site for the roof. It's all cut there and brought up and every single piece fit perfectly. So it's all computer computer cutting. Right. It's kind of amazing. You kind of think about a, a computer cutting, you know, rafters that are 16 feet long and cut at a particular angle or everything. So I that's, uh, and it helps the carpentry as well. It sort of takes it away from the, the carpenters, but it makes it a lot easier when you have to put it together in the you middle think of the computer room. is measuring twice. Um, well, I would hope so. <laughs> it's a big sign on all the computers. Yeah. <laughs> I'll add one thing that uh, I think an illustration of sort of the timber frame, it, it, the, the beauty of the timber frame, you know, the one that we're working on that I just mentioned. Yeah. Um, that L, uh, which is basically, you know, six or eight inch square posts um, and beams that are equally uh, as massive rafters that are timber frames as well. Um, and, you know, the, the mortise and tenon connections are all there. The idea was that um, they wanted to take this timber frame and sometime in, many years after the house was originally built, they had pushed it up to two stories. They wanted to bring it back to one story, cathedral the space, but then also push it up a little bit so that there was more headspace. You know, six feet of clearance is not really enough. So they decided to, you know, strip it. So now you've taken off all these sort of interior walls and nothing happens to the structure of the building because the timber frame, the skeleton holds everything. Right. And then they start to disassemble it. And, and Aaron, who's a timber frame expert who's working with us, he literally is just like, this mortise, this tenant had gone together, there's a peg in here, we'll push the peg out and we will remove this. And the peg that was put in that mortise and tenant joint 300 years ago, we knock it out, we pull this frame apart and it comes apart as if it had been put together a week or two or before, disassemble it, ship it off, label it. Um, and bring it back, and we put it back together using the same cuts, mortise, and tenons, the same hand hewn beams that were made by hand back in 1720 or several years before that, as they were making this fabricated material. And it goes back together perfectly, um, in the same way that they did it 300 years ago. It is quite remarkable to see these things come apart and know that the, there's so much precision in it. And it's so lasting that you could just put it back together, take it apart, put it back together. And there's the house that we're working with all over again, 300 years later. Timber frames are remarkable structures. Um, and to think that the last person to touch that peg was the person who made it 300 years ago. You mean the peg that's now in my garage with my collection? Oh, I think that <laughs> that wasn't meant to hold the house back together. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> some of them couldn't be saved. I might have ended up with one or two. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is it is remarkable. You can see their witness marks, you know, where they've kind of, you know, told themselves how it all goes back together and everything like that. It's uh, it's living history. It's it's really terrific. It's it's incredible. And and that you get to spend time with with the people who are experts in, in that and also experts in the new and bringing the two together. Uh, yeah, we're. We're, we're taking that timber frame building with the 19 inch wide pine bores that are the roof sheathing that have been attached to purlins. And on top of it, we are putting modern day OSB sheathing with poly iso cyanurate insulation that has been covered in a, a waterproof membrane impregnated into the sheathing. I mean, it, it is worlds colliding. Um, as sort of these old building technologies are being saved, materials are being saved, and the latest and greatest things that we have out there are being literally layered on top of it to keep this building going for another 300 years and to make it modern and comfortable. Yeah. Well, and that's sort of the, the premise of this old house, taking an old house and 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 making it work for the next for the next round. We've got about five minutes left in in our event today, everyone, and so I think. For the, to, for the last couple of questions, both Norm and uh, Kevin, uh, I wonder if you wouldn't just speak to the audience a little bit about what you hope that they are getting from, from these projects, because you, you have been such inspirations for so many people for so many years, uh, but, but, but uh, maybe speaking to, to them just a little bit about what you hope, hope they're getting from, from enjoying these, uh, these incredible programs. Um, well, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, I, I assume these people, because they're interested in this old house, are people who are interested in woodworking and building houses and modifying their house and ideas that they want to have in the future to change things in their house. And part of it is, you know, from my perspective, is my thing is the wood and, you know, the materials to build a house. But we also have to think about the technology of heating and cooling and all of that that goes into a house these days because that's very important. You know, there was a time when people started building houses and tried to make them energy efficient and they weren't working because they didn't have, it was getting too dry inside or it was getting too wet inside. And now it's sort of full, coming together um, much better. And I think by watching this old house, they, I assume they watch this old house because they're looking for information to do those things and see what some of the options are. Because you can look at a lot of magazines, but I think with this old house um, being around, uh, you know, they're talking about the newest and best materials that you can use in the house. And that gives them an opportunity to make not make the mistake of um, saying, well, that's a little bit too expensive. And I'm not sure I want to do that in terms of structure and things like that. Um, pay the bill because it pays off in the long run. Yeah. I, I would say that, um, you know, I had the pleasure last night of watching the one hour special, the, the house that Norm built. Um, and that reminded me of exactly what I think people are getting from this old house and on PBS. What they're getting is a place and in my opinion, the only place that a gentleman like Norm Abram could thrive and last for four decades. Uh, that special last night reminded me that this show um, and that PBS ecosystem is really the only place where you would get a soft-spoken, wise, kind person like Norm and some of his brothers and sisters who work with him and to give them the space to share you know, their knowledge, their respect, and their appreciation for these trades, and that it could actually blossom um, to the point where it has wide audience approval to win an Emmy in the first season, to win a Lifetime Emmy three months ago, um, and to let these people do what they do. There, there is no other place on television that would have the patience for this, that would ever have let this see the light of day. Um, and I think we all can, can compare and contrast it to the other programs that are out there. This is a unique place that allows a gentleman like Norm uh, and Tom and Richard and those guys to, to actually exist 
to flourish and to be on there so prolifically for all those years. So it is, I, I firmly believe it is the only place where that can happen. And uh, it's a distinct privilege to be part of it, just mostly so that I can work next to, you know, gentlemen like Norm. It's a, it's a tremendous place. Um, so it's it's been a privilege um, to work with you, Norm, to do it in this environment. And we've got to thank the folks who are here today joining us and everyone else who out there who supports it to create that 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 place where it can happen. Right. Absolutely. Well, also, too, you know, we were talking about this old house. Um, PBS wouldn't, you know, this old house exists because of PBS as well, because there were, wasn't going to be anyone else out there um, showing this come together. And, you know, Russ, Russ Morash, everything he did was pretty much on PBS. And um, I was lucky enough to get into the New Yankee workshop. When he first asked me to do it, I said, mm, I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> and look, you know, I'm a carpenter, I'm not a woodworker, but I had to teach myself along the way. Mm -hmm. And 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 I never imagined it would, it would last as long as it did, and I and and also because PBS put it on the air, and it's still you know available um, on videos and so forth. But yeah, it's um, it's an incredible thing. It's an incredible yeah. thing that we are fortunate enough to have both through GBH, but just PBS generally. That that is yeah. a that is a resource that continues uh, to. Yeah, to be something that we were able to rely on, thanks to your your uh, viewer and uh, listener support. And and unfortunately, we have uh, come to the end of our time together here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to uh, personally thank uh, Norm Abram and Kevin O'Connor for taking the time out of your days to to be here with us. And 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 congratulations, Norm, on on all of your work over these these many years. And. And uh, thank you for joining us, Kevin, as well. I know you got to run off to the job site and uh, and keep doing dog, it. Apparently. Oh, let the dog out too. Yeah. Uh, sorry if I didn't get to your questions. There were so many great questions, Norm. There were so many people from all over the country uh, just uh, voicing their appreciation. I think you should know that as well of, of, of all your work. And, uh, and and we appreciate you for, for coming here and for supporting PBS and, and GBH in particular. And uh, I hope you will join us in the future for another Ask the Expert event. Keep an eye out in your email for, for future events and for more information on these events and links and, and so forth. My name is Chris Voss. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us. And, and we hope to see you again sometime soon. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.